feels like it's been years since I posted a video. I haven't even posted a single wrap up yet this year. My 2024 got off to a busy and chaotic start, which means that YouTube has unfortunately had to be on the back burner for me. So today I am going to try and do a first quarter wrap up instead. I have about 50 minutes before my husband gets home from work. Somebody keeps flying a drone near my house, which is setting my dog off consistently. So it's totally possible that this film won't, or this video won't get posted either, but I'm going to do my best. So normally I do my wrap up from just the page where I write down the titles of the books in the order that I finish them. Today, because it's been three months, I am going to read them in the order that I put them in my bullet journal so that I can kind of remember in a little bit more detail what my thoughts on some of these books were. So, on December 16th, I started Freedom is a Constant Struggle by Angela Davis. I finished it on January 14th. This was one that I picked up for Jess Owen's nonfiction book club, Book Communer Read. Um, it was a very timely pick because the subtitle of it is something along the lines of... Um, it's got something to do with freedom and Palestine. <laughs> I don't remember the exact subtitle because I didn't write it down. Uh, so I did this as an ebook, which I think might have been a mistake. I don't particularly like ebooks. Nonfiction ebooks are definitely my least favorite. I prefer audio or physical reading for nonfiction. Um, and because Freedom is a Constant Struggle was a collection of essays, I think that it would have worked a lot better as an audiobook. Um, because actually reading it with my eyeballs was making me get distracted by, like, there was some weird cadence things and, like, word choices, things that would, I think, have been much less noticeable in audiobook form. Uh, so I ended up giving that three stars. And I, but I really, I do think it was a me issue, not a book issue. I think I, if I'd done it as an audio, I think I would have had a much better time. Um, the next one that I have written down in my bullet journal is How to Say Babylon by Sophia Sinclair. So I actually started this book all the way back in November. I started reading it over Thanksgiving weekend while I was at my in-laws house. And um, it took me until March 28th to finish reading this book. So yeah, I essentially finished it three days ago. Um, it's really beautifully written. Safia Sinclair is a poet and you can definitely tell that this is a book written by a poet because you have to close read the entire thing. Um, her word choice is so deliberate. She uses beautiful metaphors and similes throughout the book. Mia, why are you doing that? <laughs> Sorry, my dog is licking the bed. Um, yeah, beautifully, beautifully written, but it does mean that it takes a fair amount of mental effort. Uh, you have to really be paying attention. You can't like skim any of this. And 
so that combined with the fact that this is her memoir of growing up in an abusive Rastafarian household so we have very heavy content she's very descriptive with the abuse that she suffered at the hands of her father um, and at the culture more largely so yeah it was just it was a hard read but I but amazing an amazing book that I could not have finished any faster <laughs> than I did and those are the only two books that I started prior to 2024 and then just now have finished So the next book that I started I read all three of them together. So Delilah Green doesn't care, Astrid Parker doesn't fail, and Iris Kelly doesn't date. Uh, these first two were a reread for me. This was the only one I hadn't read before because it came out in October of 2023. Um, you don't, you don't, you really don't actually have to read them in order or read all of them. Um, but I really liked Delilah Green Doesn't Care, so I wanted to reread it. So, Delilah Green Doesn't Care by Ashley, Ashley Herring Blake. Um, so the story of Delilah Green. She lives in New York. She's a professional photographer, an artiste, <laughs> um, and she is going back to the small town that she, in Oregon that she grew up in, Bright Falls, uh, for her sister's wedding. She has been hired to be the wedding photographer, and New York is very expensive, so she can't afford to turn it down. <laughs> She and her stepsister, Astrid Parker, have a very fraught relationship. So while there, mostly because she knows it will make Astrid angry, Delilah starts flirting with Astrid's best friend, Claire. And the flirting turns into an actual relationship. Um, it is a romance, so it does have a happy ending, but the thing that I really liked about this book is that it's kind of skirting the line between romance and litfic, in that there is as much care and attention given to the relationship between Delilah and Astrid, and I would actually say that that relationship is the more important one in the book. Um, so that is what I really like about reading this book. Which brings us to Astrid Parker Doesn't Fail. And again, this is a romance, but the romance between Astrid and Jordan, Jordan is kind of secondary to the story. The more important relationship in this one is between Astrid and her mother. So Astrid's uh, wedding fell apart, in part due to machinations with Delilah and Claire and Iris Kelly, who is Astrid's other best friend. And um, Astrid is trying to figure out who she is as a person rather than who her mother wanted her to be. Astrid is in her early 30s, um, which just goes to show that you can question who you are at any point in life. Um, there is no set timeline. So this book has received some criticism for being like a 
queer for you story, that is not how it reads to me. To me, it is um, a woman who was the embodiment of compulsive heterosexuality realizing that she is in fact bisexual and it you know she talks about like the other crushes that she had on women that she just didn't realize were crushes uh, but to each their own <laughs> i really like this book i do find it a little bit stressful to read because astrid's mother is very unlikable but the romance is cute and then, finally, the last of the Bright Falls books, Iris Kelly Doesn't Date. This one is definitely my least favorite in the series. Um, it's still not bad. Like, I think I gave Delilah Green and Astrid Parker 4.5 stars, and this one was, like, nearly 4, you know? I still had a very good time reading it. Um, Iris just isn't a very interesting character to me. She doesn't have a lot to her personality other than being loud and being really into sex. Uh, Stevie, who is the soft butch love interest in this story, um, is the much more interesting one in that she has severe social anxiety, um, severe anxiety in general, and she is working to be someone who can stand on her own two feet and be respected by her friends and recognized as the adult that she is because her friends kind of tend to baby her a little bit. So again, the relationship between the two I think is kind of secondary to some of these friendships throughout the books, um, but this one definitely comes the closest to just being a straightforward romance book and that's probably the other reason that I don't love it as much as I love Delilah Green. The next book that I read, admittedly this was entirely FOMO. Um, I read The Woman in Me by Britney Spears. I did the audiobook. And if I'm being totally honest, it was not good. <laughs> like, um, I'm not a Britney Spears fan. I've never been into her music, even as a kid. Uh, I did live with drag queens for a while in college, so I have had plenty of exposure. I'm could probably recite all of the words to Toxic because they were all obsessed, but um, as far as a book goes, although I respect the struggles that she's had and, you know, things certainly have not been easy for her, this was just not a, a well-written autobiography. You know, um, when I pick up an autobiography, I expect a fair amount of like soul searching, of digging deep, of self-reflection, of understanding how things played out the way that they did and why and you know who the author is as a person. Britney Spears's book reads as very very young. Like, I would expect this to be written by someone in their late teens, early 20s, not by someone in their, I think she's in her 40s, early 40s, late 30s, I'm not totally sure. Um, but it's just very, the, the tone is very young still, everything is being a good girl or a bad girl, or, um, yeah, I just wanted her to, like, interrogate that a little bit more than she did. But if you're a Britney Spears fan, you'll probably enjoy the book. Okay, so next up is Frankenstein. So Junji Ito is probably the best known horror manga artist in Japan. 
um, Frankenstein. The first half of this book is, you know, an illustrated version of Mary Shelley's Frankenstein. Um, pretty horrific imagery, stare, stays very true to the plot. It's a good retelling. Um, I, I really enjoyed it. But I think what really makes, uh, what really makes this book good is that after the Frankenstein, we get these, this series of parallel worlds. It was um, original work for Junji Ito, and those were really excellent. Uh, he is a master of horror, truly. I love it. <laughs> Uzumaki, when I read it, gave me nightmares in a good way. So this is another one that I think is really good, both for Frankenstein but even more for the original work in there. And then the next book that I started was Naruto. I bought Frankenstein and Naruto on the same day. I went up to Uwajimaya in Seattle. Um, so this is volume one, two, and three. I am a huge fan of Naruto, the anime. It is one of my favorites. I just love it. So I was really excited to read the manga. It's basically exactly the same, at least for the first three volumes. I'd always been kind of hesitant to start the manga because there's like 72 volumes which is a lot, because manga are very expensive, which makes sense. They're much more difficult to print and take a lot more ink and all that jazz, but yeah, I don't, I don't know if I will end up collecting any more of them than this, but if I do, I'm definitely gonna do it as the collected volumes, because it costs like half as much that way to, to get them this way. Uh, but yeah, the art is even pretty true to the the show. You know, there are some things that, um, like Demon Slayer, I think has absolutely beautiful art. And I tried uh, in the show, and I tried picking up the manga, and it was nothing at all like the anime. And I just couldn't couldn't do it. I stuck with the anime on that one. So I like it when there isn't a very jarring transition from anime to manga. I cannot um, objectively rate Naruto. <laughs> I love I love the series too much to be able to actually rate the manga. And then the next one that I started was Pleasure Activism, um, The Politics of Feeling Good. So this is written and gathered by Adrienne Marie Brown because it does have essays from her, but also from other activists. <sighs> this one was a difficult read, a really difficult read for me. Not because it's not good, um, but because sometimes with activism work, it feels like you have to stay angry. Like, if you ever have moments of feeling good, of not being angry, of not being depressed, it's almost like you're not fighting hard enough. You know what I mean? Um, that's definitely something that I struggle with. And so this book was like confronting a lot of that. Um, and I actually, so I read it as an audiobook, and then I went and purchased the physical copy because the essays have um, homework at the end of them. Um, 
so I got a, a journal for doing long form journaling and I am going to reread this and journal about all of the feelings that it brings up for me because there were a lot. Ah, okay, the next book that I read, which I also did as an audiobook, was The Widow Washington by Martha Saxton. I'm doing a um, book challenge that one of the prompts was read a book by an author who died in 2023. So this book fit that prompt. Um, it came out in 2019. So The Widow Washington is about George Washington's mother. Um, who I did not know anything about, who I frankly had never given any thought to. Um, I've given fairly minimal thought to George Washington. <laughs> but, uh, this book was really interesting. It was written with, like, very clearly a feminist lens. Hi, baby. Hi. Just got your, got your little nose. Hi. Hi. I know. I know. Life is hard, huh? You wanna hold hands? No. Can you lay down? That's not lay down, that's shake. Can you lay down? He's a good girl. Okay, great. Okay. Now, let me try and finish this. Okay? Uh, da -da -da -da. Yeah, so. Uh, one of the things that I really liked about the Widow Washington that it, is that it gives a lot of historical context, um, which I always think is great in a historical biography. Some of them assume that the reader knows more about the era than they do. The next book that I read was The Menopause Manifesto by Jen Gunter, I think. Um, so I am only 35, 34, not even 35 yet. And so I've got like at least 10 years before this is something that I really need to worry about, but I hate surprises. So I do have friends that are perimenopausal, um, one of whom recommended the Menopause Manifesto as like a very overtly feminist approach to what menopause is, what it's all about. Uh, so I found it very informative. Now I know what's coming 10 years down the road. And it is one that I would recommend reading before you hit perimenopause, because it does um, have advice for things that would be helpful early. So like the more muscle mass that you have going into perimenopause, because then you will start losing it as you age. The better off that you'll be. Um, Load-bearing exercises are really good for bone strength, which helps fight osteoarthritis, which or and osteoporosis, both of which are things that affect women more than men. So stuff like that. It was really interesting. Um, it does have moments where it talks about weight loss. It does try to do it in a body-neutral way. But you can definitely tell that it is something that the author is still struggling <laughs> with. Okay, so try and cut that dog bark out. Uh, next one that I read was Second Chances in Newport Stephen by TJ Alexander. I hate this cover. I'm just, I, I just have to say it. I hate this cover. It is so ugly. <laughs> Um, this is a romance between a trans man and um, his high school boyfriend. This is a second chance romance. Um, I think that the high school boyfriend's perspective is just so precious because they... So our main character is, the, is Eli Ward, who's a trans man, lives in New York loses his job as a script writer, goes to Florida for Christmas to visit his family, and is feeling very trapped there. Hasn't seen Nick in, you know, decades, like since pre-transition. Um, so Nick is grappling with all of these, like, 
feelings that are coming up, realizing for the first time that he's not as straight as he thought he was. Uh, the story is just really, really sweet. I thought that it was well written. I think that it does a good job of addressing issues of being queer in Florida, which is not the state <laughs> that you want to be queer in. Um, pretty much the worst for that. Uh, but the author is originally from Florida, and so I think they, you know, they're bringing some, some real things into this book. So the only thing that I hate about it is the cover. Otherwise, I thought it was a great book, and I am looking forward to rereading it. Next one that I read, we are starting to get into books that I finished in February. Yeah, almost to the end of books I started in January. <laughs> so the next book that I started was The Vampires of El Norte by Isabel Cañas. Um, I did not like that one. Mm -mm, nope. Gave it two stars. <laughs> uh, it's... I think it was mostly a pacing issue for me. I really struggle with slower paced books. Um, let's see, what I wrote down was, although the setting was great, I did not enjoy this book. The characters didn't hold my interest, and the writing style was repetitive and dramatic. Should have just let it be a DNF, even the vampire lore was lackluster. Yeah. I stand by that review. Uh, okay, next one that I did was Devolution, a first-hand account of the Rainier Sasquatch Massacre. This was by Max Brooks. I listened to the audiobook. It is a full cast. Nathan Fillion reads one of the voices. That is enough for me, frankly. If you tell me Nathan Fillion is involved, I'm in. But I loved <laughs> Devolution. So it does take place in the Pacific Northwest, which is where I live. Um... So yeah, we've kind of got Sasquatch mania going on here. It's very popular. Um, most of them are like, you know, peaceful hippie Sasquatch stories. So I love that this one was instead a massacre at the hands of Sasquatch. It's highly entertaining. Highly entertaining. Um, yeah. That's coming from multiple perspectives, putting together the story from someone's diary. So it also just ends. <laughs> we don't really know what happened. Um, and the context is that Mount Rainier has blown in this. So this is a story about a community that gets cut off because of that. Uh, and then everything is just chaos. And I love it. <laughs> and I love the fact that it takes place where I live. So there are like cities and streets and stuff that he's talking about. But I'm like, mm-hmm. Yeah, that's that's a real place. <laughs> so that makes it more fun for me. I'm trying so hard to speak slowly and softly. But we're halfway through my allotted amount of time, and only just getting to the last book I started in January, so I might have to try and pick up the pace here. So I, in, I always try in January to read a book that Purple recommends for me. Um, yeah, I've had a couple of really great January books, and unfortunately this was was not one of them. <laughs> the Center by Aisha Man Manazir Siddiqui? Siddiqui? The cover is spectacular, which is basically the reason that I bought the book. Um, I did not like the story, though. <laughs> I thought that it was going to be like gothic, closed room horror, based on the description. Which um, so basically, 
our main character is a Pakistani woman living in London. She meets Adam at a language conference, and he is fluent in several languages. She thinks that's amazing. They start dating. Eventually, she gets the secret from him of why he is so good at so many languages. So she checks out the center for herself. She becomes friends with the woman that runs it. Um, this should have been so cool. Like, but frankly, the writing style was really boring. Um, like, very distracted by the fact that she uses text language while talking out loud. Which is weird. And... <sighs> see, yeah, what I wrote down was, well, that wasn't great. The best thing about this book was the cover. I wanted sci-fi horror with closed room gothic overtones and instead got whiny lit fic with a horrid main character and all the subtlety of a brick to the back of the head. Truly a painful slog. The real reveal wasn't even enough to save it. Boring. <laughs> and it did take me until March 11th to, like, finish this book. I finally had to just, like, force myself to do it. But I'm gonna keep it, because the cover's pretty. <laughs> okay. Now we are into February. So, uh, the first book that I started in February was Doppelganger by Naomi Klein. This is a non-fiction book using the, stru the structure of doppelganger mythology to explore uh, current events. So Naomi Klein is a journalist who is frequently confused with Naomi Wolf. They are not the same person. Naomi Wolf is also a cultural critic. Um, she wrote The Beauty Myth which I do have on my shelf downstairs because it was required reading when I was in college going through Feminism 101. Um, and she has gone off the deep end <laughs> recently. She's now a regular guest on Steve Bannon's show. She's an anti-vaxxer. She's a conspiracy theorist. Just truly lost her marbles. So Naomi Klein uses that <laughs> that confused identity to explore doppelgangers, but also to explore, like, our current zeitgeist. And I really liked it. <laughs> so that is one that I would recommend. The next book that I read was Mislaid in Parts Half Known. This is another book in the Wayward Children series by Sean and McGuire. out on this channel at all before. You know I love Sean and Maguire. <laughs> so this one did not disappoint. We are back hanging out with Ant. Um, it is, yeah, so good. Uh, basically going through multiple doors. Mia, my dog is now underneath me. <laughs> you gotta chill out. You're being very disruptive, but it's not very polite. Yeah, I love every book in this series. It's not shocking that I loved this one, too. Alright, next book that I read was You Will Find Your People by Lane Moore. This was one of the feminist book club picks. I don't remember if it was January or February. Could have been either one, because I started it on February 4th. Um, it was mid. <laughs> um, theoretically, this was a self-help book about how to make friends. In reality, this was a memoir about how Lane Moore struggles to make friends. And there, frankly, she lost all credibility 
to me as a person who knows about making friends when she admitted that she made friends with a woman she met on an airplane. I'm sorry. Do not talk to me on an airplane. Do not ask for my phone number if we met on an airplane. No. Mm Mm-mm. No. Um... Yeah, basically boiled down to, if you want to make friends, you have to talk to strangers, which I understand is fundamental to the process, but also, I'm not going to do it. So there. (laughs) Also, there was like a lot of really distracting grammatical errors in that one, which is neither here nor there, but does upset me. Alright, the next book that I read was The New Jim Crow by Michelle Alexander. This book is amazing. It should be required reading. Um, I would highly, highly, highly recommend pairing this with Evicted by Matthew Perry, I think. Um, So he talks about the ways that eviction notices contribute to homelessness. This book is all about mass incarceration, so it is not a, um, you know, upbeat, fun read, but it is amazingly informative. This is the old, like the original, um, they did put out a, an updated one on the 10 year anniversary that includes like a new introduction. Um, I listened to the audiobook in addition to reading, so I kind of got both. (laughs) Um, But yeah, absolutely amazing. Very well researched. Very statistic heavy. um, Very rational arguments. Super believable book that I think is the closest that I've come so far to arguments that my like racist but don't think they're racist relatives would understand as to like what privilege means and and the roadblocks in your path if you are black in America. Uh, Yeah, absolutely amazing. Amazing, amazing, amazing. If you aren't an abolitionist going into it, you will be by the time you finish reading it. It is a little on the um, academic side, so like, don't expect to read it quickly. Okay, next. Still reading manga, Hunter Hunter by Yoshihiro Togashi. Um, I cosplayed Gon, our main character, for Emerald City Comic Con this year. Um, I had interacted with the characters as the anime, so I thought um, picking up the manga could be fun, and it gave me a good character reference without having to, like... I mean, I did also take screenshots out of the (laughs) the show so that I could draft the backpack and stuff like that, but um, it was good to have a physical reference item. And yeah, not uh, it, it very much like Naruto, where because I'm super invested in the anime, I am not capable of making a um, objective rating for the book. So I really liked it. It does differ from the anime, um, unlike Naruto, which is like beat for beat out of the manga. Uh, they do like put events in different orders for this. Okay, so next, Say Nothing. This is A True Story of Murder and Memory in Northern Ireland by Patrick Radenkeefe. Patrick Radenkeefe is also the person who wrote Empire of Pain, um, which was quite popular a couple years ago. I picked up the, I actually read the audiobook version um, because I watched an episode of Hot Ones that John Oliver was on and by the time he'd eaten his 10th hot wing, he couldn't remember what he was supposed to be promoting so instead he said this was the best book he'd read recently and he highly recommended it and that was enough for me. So, (laughs) it was really good. I did the audiobook and at the end of the audiobook they were like, by the way, 
Um, we didn't read you any of the footnotes. There are footnotes and there are pictures. And I was like, well, dang it. Now I need a physical copy. Um, cause yes, there are pictures, which, you know, I don't think you really need the pictures. It's just like pictures of the people involved, but Those are all footnotes. Let's see? So yeah, I feel like I missed a bit. <laughs> so I'm gonna go back and skim the book and read the footnotes. Uh, but if you're at all interested in Irish history, I would definitely recommend this book. It is about the Troubles in Ireland. If you're not familiar, that was the period of time where um, there was a lot of violence in Northern Ireland because there were factions in Ireland that did not want to be part of the UK. They want a united Ireland. There are still factions in Ireland that want a united Ireland. Frankly, I am shocked that uh, we made it through Brexit without violence. Shocked. <laughs> but this book is really interesting if you're at all into that history. Okay, that was it. That was all I started in February. February was a wild month for me because I was getting ready for Comic Con. Um, I did almost no reading compared to like how much I would normally have done. In fact, for the whole year, I'm, I've only read 32 books this year, and that is well below. <laughs> my normal pace. Okay, the next book that I read was A Dangerously High Threshold for Pain. This is an Audible um, exclusive book. It is by Imani Perry. She is a black woman from Alabama, I believe. Uh, writes a lot of nonfiction. Her books are really good. Uh, but this one is basically, it's like two hours long, so like kind of more a long essay than a short book about, um, she has lupus, so it is about having lupus. Um, it was really interesting. I don't think that I should have read it three days after my doctor said I might have lupus, <laughs> but here we are. That's what I did. Um, yeah, it was a very powerful book on what it is like to live with chronic illness. Uh, yeah. Uh, the next book that I read was Shark Heart, A Love Story by Emily Hobbeck. I have no idea if I've pronounced that correctly. My dog is standing on the cord for my ring light. I'm just waiting for her to knock everything over. Uh, ooh, yeah, see, there we go. <laughs> Hitting her head on the camera because she's now realized. Ooh, and there it went. Okay, dramatic change in lighting. Thanks to Mia. She's just realized that she can't get back up on the bed and now she's stuck and she's not happy about it. Oh, goodness. Okay, I'll be right back. Ugh, there you go. Don't bet. Yeah, no, don't jump back off on this side of the bed. Okay. her up and move her to the other side. So, Shark Heart. This one... This is another one where the cover was really pretty and the book was more lit fic than I wanted it to be. Uh, so, Shark Heart is the story of 
a sort of magical realism kind of world where spontaneous mutations into animals happen. Um, it just wasn't as interesting as I wanted it to be. Uh, so yeah, I said it might have been my mood, not the book, because my library hold came in when my brain was consumed with sewing, not reading, but I just didn't find this book interesting. If I hadn't finished it, I would not have cared. <laughs> yeah, so if I'd had to give it back to the library before it, I finished reading it, I would not have bothered to check it back out again because it just didn't, you know, it just wasn't working for me. Um, and the next one that I read, which very much did work for me, was Black, Black Leopard Red Wolf by Marlon James. So this is a fantasy novel set in a sort of mythical Pan-Africa right at the beginning of the slave trade. And this, I wouldn't, I gave this book five stars. I would not recommend it for everyone. It is brutal. <sighs> The drone is back. Hopefully her barking downstairs is not too much. Um, absolutely brutal book. Every, every content warning you can think of. If you are a person who checks content warnings, look them up for this one. They're all in there. Um, but Dion Graham is my all-time favorite audiobook narrator, and he read this book, and he did such an amazing job that I listened to all 24 hours of this audiobook at one time speed. Granted, I did think about buying a physical copy of the book and finishing it, and then continuing to listen because I really, really, really wanted to know what was happening and how it was going to end, um, but I was so enjoying his performance. He did an amazing job with the audiobook. Okay, we're so close. We're so close. The Black Unicorn by Audre Lorde. Audre Lorde is, of course, iconic black lesbian feminist. Just, yeah, sister outsider. Flippin' amazing. Um, but I was really excited to read some of her poetry because that is, I think she describes herself as a poet rather than an essayist, so it felt wrong that I had only read her essays. Um, this book was originally published in 1978. It holds up. It is so beautiful. Um, of course, some are more moving than others, but it it's a beautiful collection. If you are into poetry, highly recommend Audre Lorde. I just picked the black unicorn because I liked the name. She has others too. <laughs> and now I want to read more of them. Okay, next I read Howl's Moving Castle by Diana Wynne Jones. This is of course the book that the Miyazaki film is based on. The only thing I wrote down here was the movie is better. The movie is better, just watch the movies skip the book. You don't need it. And it's not contributing anything. <laughs> so, you know, I am into textiles. They are my thing. I really liked this book. It was absolutely fascinating. It is broken up into, like, each chapter is an essay, essentially. Um, and I liked the way it was structured. So we have chapter one is fiber, chapter two is thread, chapter three is cloth, chapter four is dye, chapter five is traders, chapter six is consumers, and chapter seven is innovators. And each one moves sort of from the beginning <laughs> into the current day and then a little bit into the future. Innovators is the only one that's like really future focused, but it talks about like how long it would have taken to spin and weave enough fiber for a sail. And it talks about like 
inventing the drive belt to invent a spinning wheel, stuff like that. It's really good. If you're at all into textiles, I would highly recommend this book. Okay, The Space Between Worlds. This is by Micaiah Johnson. This is one of the books that I bought at Comic-Con. I ended up really liking it. I gave it 4.5 4 stars, I think. It's not perfect, but it is quite good. Um, the multi-dimensional setting really worked for me. The characters were good. I mean, it's like the same couple of characters on multiple worlds. The names are a little distractingly weird. Like, the kind of pseudo bad guy's name is Nick Nick, which is hard to take seriously. But otherwise, really liked it. Um, and I have the next one sitting on my couch because I'm going to start reading it maybe tomorrow. <laughs> um, <laughs> next book that I finished was The Body Keeps the Score by Dr. Bessel van der Kolk. Um, if you're into psychology and trauma, this is a book that you'll probably enjoy. If you're not interested in those things, not for you. Uh, okay, and then I read Dark Archive, A Librarian's Investigation into the Science of Books Bound in Human Skin. <laughs> this was by Megan Rosenblum. Um, it's kind of macabre, <laughs> I'm not gonna lie. It is a very macabre subject. Uh, there's less than 50 books in the world that are bound with human skin. It's weird that there are any at all, but this gal is a librarian, and like specifically a medical librarian, so it makes sense that this is a thing she'd be into. Um, very disappointingly, none of the books bound in human skin are occult books. They're mostly like medical textbooks bound by creepy ass doctors in the mid-1800s? Yeah. Also, oddly, not a thing Nazis did. Which you'd think if anyone was gonna, it'd be the Nazis. She specifically addresses that. So I am not, like, sentimental about human remains, so to me it was just an interesting book. Um, it is something that's gonna be very upsetting to people if you have a more religious take on death or what happens to our bodies after we die. And then, in contrast to that one, <laughs> the last book that I read in March was And This Is How to Stay Alive by Shingai Nijiri Kagunda. Maybe. I hope I came even a little bit close. Uh, so she is a Kenyan author. This book does take place in Kenya. It is less than 100 pages long, and um, a friend of mine told me to read it. She said it was really moving. It was a book about grief. Um, to me, it was a book about mental illness <laughs> and queerness in Kenya. Um, so it does start with the main character's brother's death by suicide. He is a queer kid in Kenya, um, and that is in the description of the book. Uh, and then it's sort of... an aunt gives our main character a potion that makes it so she can travel through time, but is she really... Or is she just putting her banana pants on one leg at a time? It's kind of up to the reader to decide. I felt like she was just not so. Uh, my friend thought that no, we're supposed to believe that she is traveling through time. So that was a fun, fun book for us both to read. I did enjoy it. I didn't enjoy it as much as my friend did, but... Um, it was an interesting book, and the cover's really pretty. I, I gave my friend her copy back yesterday, so I can't hold it up, but it's worth googling. Uh, my criticism of the book was that it does take 
like 30 pages to get into the flow of the writing style, and in a book less than 100 pages long, you need to get it together faster than that. Because uh, it does like switch between perspectives and tenses and pronouns, and so it does get a little confusing. But otherwise, highly enjoyable book. And that's it. That is all the books that I read for the first three months of the year with plenty of interruptions by Mia and my husband is calling. So, um, like if you like the video, subscribe if you want to see more content from me, tell me in the com comments what's your favorite book that you've read so far this year. Stay safe out there. Good night, y'all.